<laughs> All right. We're going to now go to the uh, Q&A session. And uh, please do put these into the, the, into the app, into the, the polling and Q&A session. And you can upvote. If you like somebody else's question, you can upvote that. Oh, and there's Dr. Coates. Hey, Laura. Hi, Laura. <laughs> so the, the most common question is, what's up? I don't know. What, people unclear on the concept here. So uh, here's a, a real question, though, and I'll put this out for, for, for maybe for Laura and Eric. Nail psoriasis, what has the best data? Yeah, so nail psoriasis is really tricky. Um, obviously, all of the old drugs never had any studies, so we don't really know. Um, you need long studies with long outcomes to look at good data because it takes a while, even with a very effective drug, the nail to grow out and start looking more normal but essentially we have got good data for nearly all of the biologics um, in terms of efficacy in nail disease and very limited data for anything else um, and there are some studies looking at procedural things you know injections into nail beds um, which generally is probably considered or should be considered as torture rather than medicine um, so I think generally any of the biologics have the best data in terms of nails. Okay. Excellent. Eric, anything to add? Or? No, I'd agree. I mean, I think it, it, but it also depends on how severe the nail disease is. I think there's data on a lot of things, including a premolast. So people with mild nail disease, I wouldn't necessarily shy away from another drug. But if you're really making the choice because the nail disease is driving your selection, then I think one of the biologics and, and particularly some of the best data is with the um, TNF antibodies, honestly. Okay. Yeah, but Let's go to a live question here. This is a question for Dr. Rutterman. Yeah. You're a principal investigator for the vagal stimulation for treatment of RA. Do yes, it, is there going to be a role for that in psoriatic arthritis? And why couldn't we use heart rate variability to measure those patients at risk? So uh, this is a complicated question, but, but you're right. We are, we're one of the sites for the vagal nerve stimulation um, project where they, they're implantable devices. Um, there may be a role in psoriatic arthritis. It's not RA specific. They're going to be looking at that in inflammatory bowel disease. It's really an anti-inflammatory treatment. Um, in terms of heart rate variability, I think the challenge is I'm not convinced that that's the driving um, rationale necessarily for vagal nerve stimulation because there's a lot of downstream impact on cytokine um, production and and uh, interactions and so um, I, I don't know if we're yet ready to use the the heart rate variability because that, that certainly is is locked into the whole vagal nerve issue but there are probably other mechanisms that are distinct from that that so it's make hard to use that to be honest with you Okay. One for Dr. Chambers. Uh, and Dr. Chambers, which non-biologic DMARDs were used in the study comparing non-biologic DMARDs and biologic DMARDs outcome in pregnancy? You know, they didn't specify which ones, but they were conventional non-biologic DMARDs. So, you know, it could have been methotrexate, could have been, yeah. who knows, uh, and then glucocorticoids. And uh, related, what about a premolast in pregnancy and lactation? Say again. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. A premolast? A premolast? Do I, I, a, oh, Tesla, yeah. Yeah, we we do the pregnancy registry for a premolast, or just getting ready to cl uh, end that one to close it. Um, it, uh, you know, as was said earlier, we expected it would be a very common exposure because of it not being an injection that the, as the alternative. It's been, in our experience, pretty rare in pregnancy. So huh. we have a small number, uh, but don't have anything, you know, no red flag so far. Can, can I tack a an additional question on sure. that? So, um, you know, a lot of what we learned early on, particularly about TNF inhibitors, came from the gastroenterologists who felt like they had to continue drug through pregnancy yep. because the disease was going to be worse for those patients. Yep. That's where we got that in the first place. So how are we ever going to learn about these small molecules, given that there are other options, are we ever going to have the data I, to back that up? I, but not just not just the premolest, but a jack yeah, inhibitors. Too. I totally agree, yeah. and we do one of the jack inhibitors as well. And it's the same issue yeah. that you have this catch twenty two. We don't have data, so we say don't use it, right. and then we don't have data. Right. But didn't so. the FDA did change their guidance, didn't they, to say that they could possibly consider a study that would enroll pregnant women? I don't think yeah. anybody's been brave enough to do that. Yet. Well, that's the issue. <laughs> Issue. It's, a, it's it, you know, we encourage you to do it under the right circumstances, and then you have to determine what are the right circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Kay. So, question for Dr. Chambers. Great talk. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, psychiatric complications of pregnancy are becoming very 
prominent because a mother with postpartum depression murdered her three children and yeah. tried to commit suicide. Yeah. Have you looked at psychiatric complications of pregnancy either before or after in your studies? The, it, you know, it wasn't mentioned in any of the papers that I, uh, but in our experience, it's a comorbidity that comes up quite frequently, and it stands to reason with a chronic disease that it would be common. Uh, so, you know, across the board, 15 to 20 percent of women of reproductive age have some psychiatric disorder, treated or not treated. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying I, I'm presenting the evidence today, but I suspect that it's, it's higher in women with chronic diseases, such as rheumatic diseases. Here's a, a, a simple one for, for Laura and Eric. A patient with lymphoma in remission with severe psoriasis and high passy and high disease activity, which demor to biologic would you consider? I'll take a first pass at this one, whichever one you otherwise would have considered if that was not part of the history. I, I don't see it driving my therapy. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with all the data we've seen in the last 20 years that the whole lymphoma story was disease in RA and not the drug in the first place. And that's just what I tell people. Laura? Okay, Laura? Yeah, I think I would agree. I'd want to have a conversation with the oncologist. Um, you'd want to know a bit more about the lymphoma and where they are in the treatment pathway. But I agree with Eric. You're going to take into account all the other things that we usually consider, like how bad their skin is, whether they have IBD or uveitis or other problems in terms of selecting a biologic. And I think you have to follow quite detailed shared decision-making principles in these cases. There's always some risk with every medication. There's potentially a bit more risk in patients like this, but actually if their cancer is in remission and things are stable and they are utterly miserable with bad psoriatic arthritis, then they probably do want to take that chance. But I would have an open and frank discussion with them about potential risks before I prescribed anything. Dr. Kush. So this is for Laura and Eric. I, I follow the safety data and I'm, I've always been very impressed by the safety data of biologics and psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, it's really very, very low and that's very encouraging. Maybe one of the best measures of safety is durability of a drug and in the last two years I've seen a lot of studies, especially in psoriasis, about the psoriasis drugs and that includes TNF but also the IL-17, the 12-23s, even 23s, they, the durability um, with most of them, most patients not being on them beyond two or three years is really surprising. Is it, do you have this impression as well, or am I only have a reporting bias here? No, no. I, I actually, can I start, Laura? Because I, 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 you're absolutely right, and I think it's real. And I've talked. I so I actually do a psoriatic arthritis clinic with a dermatologist. Have done for years, and we've talked about this, and we've had this discussion, and. I think we're a victim of our own success is what's happening because, because we, the, the bar has shifted and where it used to be that pretty solid control of skin disease and some joint pain was what we were going for, that there are patients coming in now who want it all to go away to the point at which we think it may be on, you know, a step too far. And so I think people are switching because the patients are driving the switch because they're saying, I, yeah, I'm doing fine, but I got this three centimeter plaque of mild psoriasis on my elbow, and that's not good enough for me. I'm going to switch biologics so that that goes away. I really think that's a big part of it. Patients have come to expect a heck of a lot more than they did even five years ago. Here's a question that got upvoted uh, to Dr. Coates. Why should practitioners do DAPSA or MDA? And maybe I'll throw a little spin on that and say, the PROs are important. The PROs correlate with these other measures. Why don't we just do PROs? Yeah, so I think like all of what we do in terms of assessing patients, we need a balance between PROs and some clinician assessed um, measures. I think we can all, I'm guessing, think of patients who have a lot of pain and would have very high PROs, but actually that's not due to active disease, that's due to fibromyalgia or other issues. And we all probably can think of stoical patients who would score themselves quite lowly and actually have quite active disease. So I think you need a balance of both. You need to know how much it's impacting on the patient, and you need to work out as a clinician whether that's due to synovitis, enthesitis, active inflammation, in which case you're going to change treatment, biologics, DMARDs, um, or whether that's pain or osteoarthritis or gout 
or some other comorbidity that's causing the problem. So I think you do need a bit of both. Um, I think you can be quite pragmatic. So um, I think MDA gives you a good checklist. You don't have to do it perfectly every time. There are some patients who I call from the waiting room and I know I'm going to be changing their treatment before they've even sat down in the chair because it's blindingly obvious that they need additional therapy. Um, so you don't have to document everything exactly in that patient. If you've already got to 10 swollen joints, then you're, you're pretty sure you're going to be changing drug. I think where the evidence shows that it makes a difference, there was a very nice Dutch study, part of um, one of our young rapper members' PhDs, where they took patients from routine practice who were not changing treatment. And actually some of them, it's these gray cases where it makes a difference. There are patients with really obvious disease who you're gonna change treatment on as soon as they walk in. Um, there are patients who are absolutely fine and have nothing. And then there's this gray area in the middle where you maybe have one or two active joints, some psoriasis, and maybe that's impacting on that particular patient more than, than another. So I think they're the cases where having a, a slightly more detailed documentation and an idea of both the clinician assessed kind of joint count data and the patient impact uh, in terms of questionnaires really helps you to make the best decision for that individual in front of you. Okay. Um, a uh, question we haven't talked a lot about, uh, PSA in a patient with HIV. Eric, and do you favor any particular biologic in that sort of a setting? That's a really good question. I haven't thought about it in a while. I mean, it is something we see, and we certainly, um, much more in the past, I think now with, with heart therapy, the, you know, the disease is so much more well controlled than most of these people that we don't, but we used to see a heck of a lot more psoriatic disease in, in um, HIV positive and AIDS patients. We, we don't as much anymore because the disease control. And, and in the past, I've been comfortable using what we've had to use. I've used TNF inhibitors when we can. I, you know, I guess I would say now, if it's an option, I might lean more towards the IL-23 inhibitors simply because the, the evidence suggests that they have less of an impact on some of the immune pathways and, and infection risk. Now, that's not based on anything. That's just if I had a choice, I might go down that path. But I, um, I don't. it's not a question we face a ton lately, honestly. Okay. Maybe following on with Dr. Dean's presentation earlier, what about in a psoriasis patient and they don't have actual synovitis on exam? What's the role of imaging, particularly ultrasound? Laura? Yeah, so we find ultrasound really useful. We have um, sonographers in our early arthritis clinic so that we can review all of our early arthritis patients if we need an ultrasound to make a diagnosis. So I think where we have and there's a lot of debate about this. There's a lot of interest in early psoriatic disease or pre-PSA. Um, and my general approach in clinic is that if patients have significant symptoms and they have ultrasound changes, then I would consider treating them. I think they have PSA. Um, I may not be able to feel it, um, but we know that clinical examination is not perfect in rheumatology. Um, we obviously also get patients who have much less in the way of symptoms or even no symptoms that have asymptomatic inflammation on ultrasound. And there's a lot of interest in those patients in terms of what happens to them in the long term. And presumably they're at significantly increased risk of PSA over the next few years. But I probably would be less keen to intervene in those patients if they don't have symptoms. Right. Jack. So I... Um, Christina, I hope you won't take offense to this because I, I, well, I got accused last week of like, where do you get these reports? Because I, well, they had some report about the, from the Journal of Metallurgy, I reported something. But anyway, I'm not going to ask you about that report. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about something from PLO, PLOS Medicine, which had a Korean study of 1.8 million pregnancies that showed that NSAID exposure was associated with an increased risk of major congenital malformations with an adjusted relative risk of 1.14 and low birth weights. Again, the, the issue of non-steroidal during pregnancy, let's take out, you know, the last eight, ten weeks, you know, and PDA stuff. Um, where, where do you sit on this data right now? I know you've looked at this. Yeah, so because of it being such a common exposure and more common in the, um, in the women with rheumatic diseases, um, certainly, you know, there's sufficient level of exposure to be able to look at this. I, I, I haven't seen the Korean paper. I mean, any, when you have a 
presumably statistically significant increased risk of 1.14, you're, it's significant because you have such a large sample size. And when you have a 0.14 increased risk, it's completely reasonable that it's due to unmeasured confounding. So I would kind of question whether or not that's, uh, that's real. But that being said, NSAIDs have been explored for uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, kind of ruled out as a risk for that. They've been ex uh, looked at in terms of, and there is data on both sides suggesting an increased risk of spontaneous abortion, that it may um, uh, interfere with implantation, uh, and that, and of course, the, the risk uh, for premature closure of the ductus for the, the reasons that you don't use it near the end of pregnancy. Um, I think the, it's a mixed bag, you know, in terms of what, at least how I read the data, in terms of whether or not NSAID use is associated with preterm delivery for the exact same reasons we've just talked about. Um, are people who are using more NSAIDs, um, and you know, we see women who are using them right up to the end of pregnancy, um, doing it because they have more severe uh, um, disease activity, and that's why they need to take them, and is that what's leading to the increased risk of preterm delivery? So I, I, don't, I wish I had a more black and white answer for you. So Eric, a couple of people followed up on your cases and, and threw in additional curves. One, uh, what about somebody on warfarin for a history of PE? The other, what about a carotid plaque demonstrated on ultrasound? Would you not use the jackanib for them? Um, good question. So warfarin, um, I, I would uh, try not to, given the sort of things that have come up, but I do have a couple patients with histories of DVT and or PE on JAK inhibitors in close follow-up with the hematologist who's following them. Um, in most cases, they're on um, lifelong anticoagulation with it, and it's usually because we didn't have, it was the best option for them, we tried other options. So I, I wouldn't say it's a hard no, but I would generally look elsewhere. The carotid plaque, I, you know, it depends on how significant it is, and so you have to look at it in the context of all the rest of the cardiovascular risks. And, you know, I mean, generally, if you see significant carotid plaque, you're going to see the rest of those risk factors, and I think I would steer away from a jack inhibitor, again, for all the reasons that, that I talked and Stanley talked about. And, that's and, and why did they look for, at the carotid? Why did yeah, they why look why they were looking in the anyway. first place. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, and you got to be... You gotta be a little careful. I mean, if they, if somebody did an ultrasound for not a great reason and they saw a little bit of plaque and it doesn't look significant, I would be careful about overinterpreting that. But you're right. It depends on why the, somebody thought to go look in there in the first place. And then, uh, absolutely last, uh, the question that's upvoted the most. Again, what's up? I'll handle that one. What's up now is lunch. Um, for those of you virtually, if you, there is the, uh, the virtual, uh, uh, showcase theater that's, uh, starting in 1220. For everyone else, let's, we have a, a big afternoon of a lot of good lectures and a couple more pods. So please come back promptly at one and we'll be all set. Very good, uh, big thank you to our speakers. I have a quick question for Jack before we head off. The giant RNL on the stage, are you going to be auctioning that off at the end? Because I'd really love that in my living room. What, that in your living room? Yeah. <laughs> all right, we'll see you all. Enjoy the lunch and go see the, uh, the exhibits. Thank you.